Welcome to everyone who is attending our webinar today, or uh, what, what we refer to as a masterclass, because this is a session that's uh, presented by a specialist in the field. Um, I represent uh, Corporate Training Unlimited, CTU, Corporate Training Unlimited. For those who are familiar with us, we do specialize in technical IT and business training, not just from a, a student perspective, but also from a corporate perspective. And every now and then we do host informative sessions that address popular topics in the industry right now. And I think we all know, and we've heard it a lot, AI is really relevant at this moment, and it, it's just growing as time goes on. Um, and we decided to have this session just to ensure that, you know, we can stay informed and share our knowledge um, in collaboration with our um, uh, uh with, with someone like Yuan as well, who can share insights from his side. So I'm uh, here representing CTU, and uh, we are partnering with Yuan Stain from AI for Business. Uh, Yuan is our guest speaker today. He is a specialist in the field of AI, and as, as we've referred to it as well, human-centered sp specifically, based on how humans interact in the workplace and how AI can influence that. But Yuan, I think um, I'm not going to speak just for you. You're welcome to introduce yourself as well, and uh, then we can jump right into it. Colleen, thank you for this wonderful opportunity. Um, just before I say a little bit about myself, it's so nice and always nice to work with you and the team at CTU. Um, everyone on the on the um, webinar or the masterclass, reach out to Colleen and her team regarding your educational requirements, especially after what I'm going to tell you today, because the world is changing rapidly. There's a lot of confusion about this topic. And I think CTU is so well positioned to take you and your team by the hand and lead you into this new, scary, unknown era of what AI is going to do to our businesses and to our careers. Um, like Colleen mentioned, I, I call myself an AI, I'm oh, sorry, a human-centered AI advocate because what I've seen in this field over the last decade is that most of the talks is about the tech and that's not irrelevant. But what about the people? What are we going to do with people? What about all these supposed job losses? Is it real? Is it not real? Job changes, new ways of educating. There's a lot of confusion. So um, hopefully I will leave you today with a few common sense tips, because the one thing, one of the many things AI can't do is replace your common sense. Um, and you'll see I will allude to the fact that common sense is not that common anymore because everyone's jumping on this chat GPT bandwagon. But I also want to leave you with some practical tips to consider for your own career and for your own organization. Um, I want to share a few use cases and it might give you a bit of a chuckle about how stupid people become when it gets to AI and the blinkers in their eyes and thinking AI can fix everything. So I've got a few slides and, and Colleen will distribute the slides uh, afterwards. You'll see my slides are pretty simple. It's not death by PowerPoint. Um, there's a number of books that I'm going to refer to that I really want to encourage you to find on, on Kindle or whatever your preferred platform is. The one thing that we can do is to keep on educating ourselves, whether it is through a formal training like with CTU and definitely through just watching YouTube videos with the common sense because you can't believe everything reading books. Keep on educating yourself. So I'm going to fire off my uh, slides shortly. Uh, we're going to definitely have some room for Q&A afterwards. So please, yes. during the conversation, leave your questions. We're going to get to as many as them as, they, as we can. As I always say in these sessions, you will be surprised how little I sometimes think I know about this topic because it changes so quickly. Um, I do have experience of how I've seen it gone wrong that I'm going to share with you. But they, what I love about the questions and the comments is that we also learn a lot from it because sometimes you mention something that I've never considered before. That's valuable to me. So please, I encourage you. There are no stupid questions. We're going to get to everything. So okay, I'm going to fire off the slides and then we're going to get going. <clears throat> While you're doing that, Yuan, I'll just mention to the audience again. Um, so we we did set out an hour and a half for today's session, mostly for the majority of the hour to be used for presentation. But we want to try and use the last 20, 20 minutes for Q&A. So you're welcome to leave your questions in the chat box. Um, I will just prepare um, the content on them. And if your questions are relevant to the presentation, we will address them at the, the end of the session. So please feel free to do so and use the chat box for that. We know there's a Q&A button on uh, Teams, but please use chat as that's quite simple and everyone can see what you're asking. Um, 
obviously we want to address as many as we can, but the questions that seem most relevant to our topic, we will definitely address at the end of the session. Thanks, Johan. Super. Also want to say good to see some familiar names on the, the delegates. Dolan, uh, Donald, sorry, rather, I'm uh, glad you're here. I'm glad there's a number of fellow centurions on the call, you know, <laughs> so, uh, but I look forward to our collaboration. Uh, Colleen, can you see my slides yes. and full screen? Okay, you're ready super. To go. Okay, so I'm going to go through the the, the um, agenda just now, but obviously this topic of AI and the future of work is a hugely hot topic. If what AI is, is greatly misunderstood. So in some of my slides, I'm going to just make sure we all are on the same page because um, pe people think it's something that it's not, but it impacts all of us, not just our organizations and our teams. I'm sure everyone on this uh, masterclass is thinking, will I have a job in five or 10 years? Will AI just take over everything? Or are there things that only I can do as an experienced thinking human with common sense? And are there things that AI technologies and automation can do that it can do better than me? And I don't want to do it in any case. So I can focus on the things that's important to me. So we're going to start off with this, the conundrum, because that is what we all are thinking about, job displacements. Will we go through a massive job displacement experience over the next few years? Is it scaremongering? Is it real? Um, we're going to look at some of the previous so-called industrial revolutions because every time the net effect was um, an increase in jobs, although I think this time it's going to change. I want to talk to you a bit about where technology is going and what I'm seeing because that also impacts our employability into the future. I'm going to spend a little bit of time on what is AI really and what is automation and what is an AI tool because you're going to have a lot of vendors and partners and at conferences where everyone talks about AI, where half the time people don't really even know what they mean. So I want to make sure you understand what is AI in simple terms, but also when is AI the tool that people are selling to you or when is it just normal process automation? I want to talk about common sense. And are you going to hear this word a lot? Because sadly, I don't know why, as AI's power increases, the people I deal with, my corporate clients, the training I do across many organizations, it seems that people are, have stopped thinking for themselves, trusting AI. I want to leave you with a few practical steps to consider for yourself and for your business as you embark on this journey of considering whether this technology is suitable for you. And then at the end, I want to just touch a bit about education. We have a huge problem across the world. One of the big topics about future employability is the current state of our educational systems. And uh, I'm going to share some ideas and an article I've written that, that got a lot of traction uh, with that as well. So I want to start off with this futurist. Now, I'm definitely not a futurist, although a lot of what I do is thinking about the future, helping organizations getting ready for this future with technological disruption. And, and a great quote I once heard, hence the picture, is that a futurist is a blind man in a dark room looking for a black cat that's not there. And what I'm trying to say is, of course, we all have our opinions about where the future is going. And some people are very smart and, and we need to listen to them. But this technology is impacting us so much and it's changing things so quickly that even what I say today, you need to take with a pinch of salt and think for yourself. And whatever YouTube video you watch or book you read, as we should, self-educating ourselves, we have no idea where we're going to go. I mean, just over a year and three months ago before ChatGPT came out, we had no idea where we would be today. In just a few months, given where large language models are, where generative AI is, and they reckon in the next five years, these platforms may be about a thousand times more powerful than they are today. So this is not a long-term view. It's not what will happen over the next 30 or 50 years. It's about the next two to five years, 10 years at the most at the most. So how can we pivot our careers, change our organizations to get future ready? But we're all just trying to figure this out together. And that's why what I love about these kind of events is not just me telling you what I think. It's about learning from each other because you all have your own experience, your own unique experience, whether it's with AI or not, your own business experience, career experience. You have questions that's very specific that I might never have considered. 
So we really need to have a collaborative approach. Whether you're a specialist or not, it doesn't matter. Everyone's voice counts. And you'll see later on in my presentation, when I get to the practical steps, I'm going to emphasize the fact that we need to include people in our organizations from different areas of speciality, from different ethnicities, obviously gender diversity and the like, to make sure we get this right, because we inevitably have our own biases as humans, and we will build it into these algorithms, not necessarily meaning it in a bad way, but it will negatively impact people who are different than us. So a blind man in a dark room looking for a black cat that is not there. The conundrum is, is how do we as humans interact with rapidly advancing technology? And it is rapidly, rapidly advancing. What is the role of a human in a, in a space of an office or in a, in a team doing work or in your own personal capacity or even in the future of our children? in the light of technology that's becoming so powerful. And most of the organizations I deal with from a consulting point of view are grappling with this, especially the HR teams, learning and development teams, and the recruitment teams, is what is that balance between the things that only humans can do and that only technology can do? And how do we then change our recruitment practices, our learning and development, our educational practices, our uh, promotional uh, policies? according to this. Now, I've done a lot of work with uh, numerous HR teams over the last two or three years. And the one thing that none of them have even thought about is I have a team of humans. So I say I have a team of 10 people in a procure to pay team, for instance. Now I'm starting to introduce non-human intelligence in the form of digital twins, digital assistants, AI chatbots and the like. Do we even have an onboarding process for this technology like we have with humans? A lot of the clients I work with even give a digital agent a staff or a contractor number so that they can track its um, usability, its costs and the like, its utilization. Now, if we have 10 people and we introduce one non-human intelligent agent, that's one thing. But what if in the next few years you have two people and eight of the agents are non-human intelligent agents. Do we even have an HR policy around that? Do we have a, do we have a change management policy around that? Um, how do we onboard and manage these non-human intelligent systems? So this is our conundrum. And then the impact, of course, on our future, our ability to earn money, to make a living. Where will it go? So that is really the conundrum we're sitting with. And I just took a few screenshots. But any day, if you do a search on Google News or, or on many of the other platforms, you will see these headlines. You'll see a, a range of, don't worry about it, um, AI will never take our jobs on the one hand, to on the other hand, total chaos, we're going to have to worry about it right now, we will most likely never have jobs again. And obviously somewhere in the middle of that spectrum is the truth. Now people who think this is not going to happen has a problem. We are now in the so-called fourth industrial revolution, which is a horrible way of talking about it. That's the World Economic Forum. And then what a lot of people will say is in every industrial revolution, as I've just alluded to, that even though there were initially a lot of job losses, like a donkey cart rider had to become a train driver or whatever, reskilling once, that the net effect at the end of that cycle was positive. Many, many more jobs were created. And I will show you a short little video clip from Yuval Noah Harari in a few slides where he talks about this. But this is the first time in our history where the um, impact of change is so rapid that we will not at scale quickly enough be able to upskill ourselves and others. So we cannot refer to the previous so-called industrial revolutions and say, don't worry, we'll create more jobs. We will displace millions and millions of jobs in this cycle and we are already almost on the brink of the fifth industrial revolution so how are we going to keep up it's not scaremongering it's a reality and, and the people i deal with and speak with i often say don't be caught asleep at the wheel be awake not out of fear but just be realistic when it comes to your children's future your own future make sure you upskill and gone are the days 
where you, were, for instance, were a plumber and you went to night school for three years to become an accountant. And that's what you do for the rest of your life. We are living in a world where we're going to have to keep on upskilling, keep on changing and pivoting our careers as technology increases in strength for the rest of our lives. So, yeah, a lot of scary things out there. I just don't think we should be eyes blind and shut when it comes to what this will do with us. Now, in the last year with ChatGPT and related technologies, there are many similar platforms. I've seen people on two sides of the scale, and I want to ask you that today. When you think about AI, even if you feel you don't know all that much about it, what is your impression? Do you fall on the one side of the scale that's quite scared, quite negative, often influenced by Hollywood movies, killer robots, taking all our jobs and so forth? Or do you maybe fall on the other side of the scale where AI is the best thing that we've ever done? It can automate everything. We can chat GPT everything. It can fix all of our business problems and so forth. Now, these are obviously two extremes. We all fall somewhere on that scale. And what I've seen in my consulting work over the last year because of chat GPT is that whereas a lot of the people I dealt with were on the negative, scared side of it. Many of them are now on the super positive side of it. And that's almost worse because they overestimate how currently powerful this technology is because it's not that powerful yet. It's not a silver bullet. You can't just chat GPT everything. You can't just AI and automate everything. And uh, most of my meetings with clients is just to dumb it down a bit and just to give them a reality check because my meetings will often start with, we want to AI everything. We want to automate everything. And then I will ask my client to do what? What is the end result of automating everything? And then often I've seen they haven't thought it through. They often have a mandate from the top. The board or the CEO has said you have to automate 20 or 30 or 50% of your business. And if my KPIs and my potential for promotions and increases depend on automating an AI stuff, I'm surely going to automate an AI everything I can, whether it makes business sense or not. So I wanted to just ask you, think about that. Are you a bit more toward the pessimistic side? Or are you maybe a bit more toward the optimistic side? And where do we find that balance in the middle? And I now, think, I um, Johan, if, if yes. I might add, there's no, sure. shame, there's no shame in feeling a little bit more on the skeptical side. I think a lot of people might not want to admit to that because we're supposed to be so excited about it. But I love that you mentioned that even being too excited about it can also not be a good thing. So, yeah, it's it's it's, it's a great perspective to look at. Oh, that's good to hear, Aline. Thank you. Look, I think to be informed and somewhat skeptical is, in my opinion, the best place to be in. Don't be overly excited about it. Don't totally fear it, but you have to check it out. Does it make business sense to your business? Because you know, what I often tell clients these days is if you're not using Excel properly yet, you most likely are not nearly ready for AI. Use the tools you have. Be skeptical with all these promotions, all these vendors trying to sell you platforms and stuff. And often those platforms, whether it's chatbots or, you know, um, automated decisioning systems and the like, they are amazing. But your business is very probably not even nearly ready for it. And we're going to go into some of those things. So I think a healthy and informed skepticism is, in my view, the better place to land on that scale, if you would. Um, I've mentioned that I'm going to show you a number of books. So this book by Sean Cully, Transition Point from Steam to the Singularity, is a must-read book. It's about, I think, 550 pages. It's quite a read. It's, but it's one of the best books I've ever uh, read. It's about three years ago, and, and he and I have become friends. We often are on webinars together. He's in the UK. Um, he approaches this topic with a lot of common sense um, as a non-technical person, talking about the impact based on the history. And that this is where Nikolai Kondatriev comes in. And there's so much I can say about him. He was a Soviet-era economist, who was tasked by um, the leadership to, to look at the difference between Western era um, democracy and capitalism as opposed to Soviet era communism. And he came up with the conclusion that the, even though in the West there's a lot of crashes and a lot of ups and downs in the economy, there's still no 
reason to say it is worse than communism and he was eventually executed for his views. But he be, and, and I got a lot of what I have learned about him from this book by Sean Cully, so really worth reading. But he came up with these waves, these so-called K waves or conductive waves. And, you know, and others like Schumpeter, philosophers that worked with him, uh, called it different things like waves of destruction. But and, and, the, and these waves that you see on the screen right now somewhat aligns with the so-called industrial revolutions. But the point is we are currently in this sixth wave. You can see there uh, nanotechnology and um, healthcare. We can bring in large language models and the like. But there's always this drop and then this increase. This, this in this drop, uh, you know, the markets crash. People overestimate what technology can do. There was, you know, the dot com boom a few years ago and the like, or the so-called AI winters. And then there's this uplift again, where a lot of new startups and companies start. We are but in this uplift that will reach a peak and then will drop again. And people who read the markets make a lot of money from this. But I wanted to just give you very briefly a historical context. We as humans are innovators. We are tool creators. That was, that's one of the many things that sets us apart from other entities um, on Earth, other animals, mammals and the like. We actually make tools. Now, other animals can also use tools to a very uh, limited way. But it's the first time in our history, if we think of generative AI, where the tools that we can we create can also now create its own tools. So our tools have become tool creators. And to a large extent, this applies in coding at the moment, where these algorithms can create its own codes, improve on your code and the like. But I think we'll see it more and more in the so-called cyber physical realm with 3D printing and other things, where algorithms will create on its own physical objects that will benefit us or not to a large extent so it's always worth looking back at where we've come and this rapid increase of technology now on Kondratriev and on what he said he said i could speak for hours but i'm going to just leave it there just remember we are on this upturn the sixth wave it's nothing new it's always happened but the rapid rate of increase um, when it comes to the power of our tools and how quickly it changes is something we've never seen in our history before. I want to go to Arari, and again, and I'm going to show you some of his books. And I'm sure many of you know about him or have read his books. Fantastic talks on YouTube as well. You all know Harari. He did this talk in, in Davos in 2020. And I'm going to show you a short clip of the video shortly. But his books is maybe what has changed my thinking about this technology the most. And look at this quote from one of his books. He said, just as mass industrialization created the working class, the AI revolution will create a new unworking class or what he calls the useless class. And that's that thinking that this industrial revolution will not ultimately create a positive net effect. The jobs it is creating is so specialized and so technical that most people will never be able to pivot, increase their skills, re-educate themselves. And, and then the question is, where does that leave us? And, and what he talks about in one of his books is, if most people on earth in the next, say, 20 years are without work, what will the impact be on our societal um, world? Will we come to a place where we will have huge upheavals I mean, we see this when there's a natural disaster, when there's a, a tornado ripping through a town or a flood. People start raping and pillaging. We, we get to our most very basic human animalistic instincts. But will we get to a potential Mad Max world in the next 20 or 50 years as more and more people are without work? And I am not a um, pessimist about this tech. I mean, the potential benefits are incredible. I'm just wondering, if we don't do this right, and because we have no regulatory framework for it, no enforcement of how to do it fairly and ethically, will we really give power to certain nation states like the Chinese, for instance? And we already have given a lot of our data and power to the large firms like Alphabet or Google, Meta or Facebook and others. They are already more powerful than any nation state, including the US, when it comes to their influence. And this year, and I wrote about this two weeks ago in, in Business Day. It's the first time in our history 
where more than a billion people on earth will participate in national elections across the world. And in the era of fake news, post-truth, deep fakes, is to what extent will this technology potentially impact the construct of how we are have come together as a liberal society? Here's just some of uh, Rari's books worth reading, all of them, but Sapiens is definitely the place to start. And Homo Deus and, and then 21 Lessons is also great. I mean, he, I think, and what's also interesting for me about Harari is that, I mean, he's, he's probably the most prominent voice on AI, but he's a, a historian and a philosopher. And what I like about that is, we have, as I've said earlier, we have too many talks from technologists and not enough from ethicists and philosophers and academics about how this stuff, this technology, is rapidly changing the world we live in. So again, apart from the book of Sean Cully that I've just shown you, have a look at Harari's books if you haven't read it yet. There's one more book that I'm going to show you shortly. Now, the next slide will be a video. Uh, it's about one and a half minutes long. It's from Harari's talk at uh, Davos in 2020. Hopefully the audio comes through and hopefully your bandwidth will allow it. And if it doesn't, don't worry about it. Minute and a half and I'll, I'll get back to my slides. I'm just going to fire up this video have a look at it and, and then I'll get to my next slides. First, we might face upheavals on the social and economic level. Automation will soon eliminate millions upon millions of jobs. And while new jobs will certainly be created, it is unclear whether people will be able to learn the necessary new skills fast enough. Suppose you are a 50 years old truck driver and you just lost your job to a self-driving vehicle. Now, there are new jobs in designing software or in teaching yoga to engineers. But how does a 50-year-old truck driver reinvent himself or herself as a software engineer or as a yoga teacher? And people will have to do it not just once, but again and again throughout their lives because the automation revolution will not be a single watershed event following which the job market will settle down into some new equilibrium. Rather, it will be a cascade of ever bigger disruptions because AI is nowhere near its full potential. All jobs will disappear, new jobs will emerge, but then the new jobs will rapidly change and vanish. It's so worth, um, if you Google him, um, you you well know Rory Davos, to listen to his whole talk. But something that stands out for me there is that gone are the days of studying for a career and doing that for the next 40 or 50 years and then hopefully going to retirement if you can afford it. We're going to have to continually re-educate ourselves, change our careers, and learn how to work with technology. So in the next two slides, I want to just briefly touch on what is AI and when is a tool AI or not, because it's still hugely misunderstood. My, my father about a year and a half ago asked me, what is this AI stuff I'm doing? And I struggled to explain it to him, and not because he's stupid, he's just not in technology. So, you know, people that do the work that I do often use terms like AI, machine learning, cloud computing, Internet of Things. I mean, we throw all these terms around. And sometimes we we don't even know what we what we are saying. How do you explain it? And, and I love this one saying that if you can't explain a difficult thing in simple terms, there's a good chance that you yourself don't understand it. So I just, I kind of devised a way to explain to my dad what is AI, and I've used it in so many training sessions and talks, and it's super simplified, and there's a lot more to say. But what I do is I bring up these four icons. And then what I say is when we as humans do work, again, in a very simplified manner, there are four basic things that we do. And if you look at these icons from top left, the one is we can see, we can read, we see the environment around us, we can read emails, we can read and understand instructions. And then the, the next icon on the top right is it's an outbox, which means we can execute on the work. So your boss sends you an instruction, you can see it, you can read it, you actually go and do the work. And then the one bottom left is like a, a voice bar or a sound bar. As humans, we understand language. 
um, we speak our language or languages, but not only do we understand the language, we understand the nuances. So I can understand from your tone of voice whether you are excited, whether you might be deceiving me, whether you are angry. And the bottom right icon is just continual learning. As humans, we keep on learning. We learn through our mistakes. We learn through new information. And then I overlay these words. Basically, what is AI? Computer vision. This is uh, facial recognition, self-driving cars, but even as simple as extracting data from documents that you've received that makes sense. That's so easily automatable. And then we get to automation, automating certain business tasks through robotic process automation, or these days we talk a lot about intelligent automation. Um, and I'm going to show you a few use cases for that. Language understanding, I mean, our chatbots that we use, even though many of the ones we use are just glorified FAQs, frequently answered questions, they're not very smart. But there are some chatbots I've worked with, whether it's text or voice, that's so good at understanding what I'm saying, answering my questions, and then machine learning. The fact that if we set these algorithms up in the right way, it can learn by itself. It can improve itself very simplistically. That is artificial intelligence. And then the next one is, when is a tool an AI tool? And, and I think this is important for all of us because you will go to a conference, you will read a book, you will have a vendor come to you, and a lot of people will brand their tool AI. But if you look under the hood, it is just automation. It doesn't think, it doesn't learn. And, and again, here we get to the four icons. The first thing you have to look for is, does it offer prediction? Can it look at all the data it has access to and make accurate future predictions? Because normal automation tools will just do the job it needs to do. But if it can see patterns into the future, whether it's your customer spend, whether it's your debtors, whether it is potential churn and so forth, it's most likely an AI tool. The second thing is self-learning, back to machine learning. If these algorithms can keep on improving itself based on the data that they are fed, Without human intervention, it's most likely not just automation, it's most likely AI. AI can see patterns in data that humans never will be able to see. If you have 100,000 customers and you maybe interact with them every day through your digital apps or channels, predicting what your clients might need in real time without human intervention and very accurately is what AI can do. It's not just an automated tool, an automation tool. And, and this one is important, answers. We have moved from a world of questions to answers. And, and ChatGPT really kicked this off, especially the integration into the Microsoft suite. But we also have it with Google Bard and a, a platform called Cloud and, and Claude rather and others. You know, if you do an internet search on Google, you, you don't, you normally don't get the answer. You get you receive the most probable websites that contain what you're looking for. But, but essentially, you're giving me homework. I still need to click on those links to find out whether this is what I want. But with ChatGPT, especially in Microsoft's um, search engine, Bing, which I use more and more these days, you, you get on the one hand the links, and on the other side of the screen, you typically get the answer. Because that's the thing. Just give me an answer. Don't give me homework. So if you have a platform that provides answers to your questions, it's probably AI. If it automates all the resources you need to go through yourself, it's most likely not AI. Now, I've gone through it quickly. And again, this is a topic for a long discussion. And, and it also might help you on that scale of where you are with maybe very negative or very positive. But on the one hand, AI is super powerful. On the other hand, it's not nearly as powerful as we think. And if it can predict, if it can learn and improve by itself, if it shows you patterns that you weren't looking for, and if it gives you answers that you're asking for, it's probably an AI tool and not just a normal kind of an automation tool. Now, the HR teams in particular, like I've already said that I work with, and, and most business leaders are grappling with this. Where do I find the balance when it comes to what humans can do and what machines can do? And how does it impact my recruitment approach and policies? my onboarding? How does it include my, my whole life cycle of managing my staff through learning and development, uh, increases, um, advances, and so forth? Uh, what can only humans do and what can only machines do? 
most of the clients I deal with, and a lot of them are large corporates, are grappling with this. And, and you are probably as well, or hopefully, to be honest, when you think of your future structure, your your the kind of team construct that you want, whether it's your sales, HR team, procurement teams, and so forth. Um, what's the balance? How many humans do you need? How many humans do you have to get rid of? Which is a horrible thing to think about. And are you getting rid of years and years of experience because you think only AI can do it? Because that's the mistake we made. So this whole topic of today, AI and the future of work, lands almost on this slide as business leaders. And we might need a bit of help from experts. Not always. Sometimes it's a bit of common sense as well. Is can technology really do what my people can do? And can we alleviate people from the work that they should never have done? Because it's low value, repetitive kind of work. This is the conundrum. This, I think, was my second slide. I've used this slide before in one of our webinars. This triangle, and I'm going to explain it very briefly. If you take a triangle divided in three parts, if you think of the role you are performing or the roles that some of your team members are performing, the whole, the bottom level is the totally mundane, boring, repetitive tasks, the work that no one really wants to do. But it's part of your job, report writing and so forth. The middle tier is more your digital interactions through data, some of the things that's actually fairly automatable. And the top part of the triangle is what only humans can do. And I often use this model in my consulting work is how do we take your team and move them closer to the stuff that they are really good at through years of experience, through thinking, through common sense, and move them away from the stuff, the admin stuff, the meeting booking stuff, the following up on email stuff, and so forth, that kills them because it almost takes the humanity out of you. I mean, who wants to do a job where you never have to use your brain? You're like a robot you are already, and that's why I call it, in fact, this slide I normally call taking the robot out of the human, is what are the things in your job that's very robotic, very repetitive, that AI can do? Let the AI do it, or the automation tools, to set you free from the stuff that you can do. Nothing replaces FaceTime with a customer. Um, empathy with a client, looking somebody in the eyes, understanding their problem. You can't AI that. But how do you get to your clients three, four hours a day if you have to spend nine hours a day doing reports that AI can do? So what is that balance between humans and AI? Now, many of you might know about this TV program. I actually don't even know if it's available anymore. Undercover Boss. That's where they would take the CEO of a company and will disguise him or her to actually go and work with the normal workers or the worker bees to actually go sit on the factory floor or in the, on the production line or in the procurement office without them knowing you are actually the CEO and to actually experience firsthand their joys, their fears, what they hate about their work, what makes them excited. And this is something I've come to do more and more with my clients is don't make AI and automation decisions that will impact your workforce when you are 15 layers above them in the hierarchy based on a spreadsheet or based just on what a consulting firm have told you. And the, and the reason why these automation and AI initiatives go wrong is because we're automating the wrong things for the wrong reason in the wrong way. You have to understand the people who will be impacted by it, what will make their job better and easier before you start just automating things. And I'm going to give you a case study. But any one of you who is in a leadership position, get over yourself, please. You don't have to disguise yourself. Spend more and more of your time as an equal, not as the boss, keen to learn from them with the lowest level of people in your firm, the security guards, the administration people, and so forth. Because they will often have insights into new ideas, and they might never have the opportunity to share it. They might fear that people will laugh at them for their ideas. But there are people in your company who are at the lowest level who can revolutionize your business if you actually spend time with them, get to know them, listen to their ideas. So I encourage everyone on this masterclass, irrespective of your level in your business, get to work with and know as time permits with the people who are actually doing the work because the insights that will impact your 
automation and AI decisions will be invaluable. You can't just make it in the boardroom after not speaking to any one of them. Philosophy is, is a, before I get to this case study, important. I often say this to clients. Now, I understand we don't live in a lala land, um, in a kumbaya land. We have businesses, we have KPIs, we, we live in a hugely competitive world. But what is the philosophy behind automation? Because I will often say this to my clients because they want me to help them automate stuff. To do what? What is the end goal of automation? And then they will say things that are relevant. We want to be able to move faster. We want to decrease our operational costs. We want to gain market share. Those are relevant business um, initiatives where you can bring in automation. But here's the end goal of automation in my view. is to alleviate people from work that people should never have done in the first place. That dehumanizes us because we are doing work that we don't need any thinking. We, we just walk in like a robot every day. So I try and bring my clients back to a, both a practical business view, but also a bit of a philosophical view. If you, because in most of the AI and automation initiatives I've worked in or I saw, because it was done wrong, the work of the people that it impacts most became even more complex because now they have to need, learn a new tool. Now, rather than taking one hour to do a task, because they have to do this new tool that no one even asked them about for their input, it now takes them three hours to do it. The philosophy of automation ultimately is to alleviate people from work that people should never have done in the first place and let people, irrespective of their rank in the business, focus more and more on what makes them uniquely human, uniquely experienced, with unique insights and common sense. So we've got about 10 or 12 or so minutes before we get to Q&A. I want to tell you this story. And this is one of my favorite stories. If you've ever heard me speak before, you've most likely heard this story. About a year and a half ago, one of our large hospital groups brought me in to help them with the automation strategy for the front desk of the hospitals. About, if I remember correctly, about 70, 70 hospitals nationwide. Now, there's only one or two groups that, that fits that bill. And when I walked into this boardroom, uh, all the execs were sitting there. Uh, three of the walls were whiteboards, and they were scribbling all over it, mind mapping, planning. They've really been thinking through this thing. And, and as you know, in a hospital front desk, like many admin tasks, very repetitive, very mundane. I mean, if you went to your doctor or your hospital six months ago, there's a good chance you're going to have to fill in the same forms again. It's very manual, very form um kind of driven and the like is very little technology involved. So the use cases were there. I mean, there's a lot we could have done and that we've done with these front desks around automating certain things rather than accessing four different platforms and systems and spreadsheets to get to a client's or a patient's data. You can automate that. Um, but I said to these executives in the, in, on that day that I'm, I can't help them. And I said, why? Because I'm this AI expert dude, apparently. I, and I asked them, have you actually spent time with these people whose jobs you're going to automate away? And they said, and of course they said, no, they haven't, because who does that? And I asked, because I knew it was going to fail. And then reluctantly, they gave me permission to spend time with about 20 of these administrators, very relaxed over a coffee, to understand their day-to-day -day job, what's bothering them. And you know, the, <clears throat> the biggest problem they had in this one hospital in particular, which was their head office, was that the printer was too far from them. And they told me that with every patient interaction, on average, they had to walk to the printer three times. So as an AI expert, can you guess what my recommendation was to the board? Bring the printer closer. It sounds so stupid. It's laughable, really. But I want you to think about this, because this is now what I'm asking my clients these days. In light of the story I've just told you, when you think about AI and tools and automation, the future of work, upskilling people and so forth, and this comes back to the common sense topic, what is your bring the printer closer moment in your organization? Because to reach efficiencies and effectiveness, you may or may not need software or AI or automation. The end goal is still efficiency and, and effectiveness. But don't jump on the AI bandwagon because you think that's the golden or the silver bullet, rather. 
It could be as simple as bringing the printer closer. And unless you're the undercover boss, spending some time with your people on the ground, you will not have a clue of the small little tweaks that's got nothing to do with AI and chat GPT and automation that will make their lives better. It's a stupid story, but I talk about this every time, and it's totally changed my way of consulting with clients. What is that most common sense, small tweak thing that may not even nearly be related to technology that you can change with your people's input that makes their lives better make them better with your clients, increases your income and your market share and the like. So always remember this. Whenever you look at this tech, what is your bring the printer closer moment? I want to tell you a brief story of, about Elon Musk. Now, this book that you see on the right by Walter Isaacson is a brilliant read. This is now the, the fourth book or the fifth, I think, that I wanted to tell you about after Harari and, and uh, Sean Cully. It's a biography. Um, Walter Isaacson also wrote, wrote the biography on Steve Jobs and others. He's a brilliant writer. What I like about this book is he had Elon Musk's permission to spend time with him for two years, unfettered access. He, he saw and heard everything. And also that when he finalized this manuscript, that Elon Musk and his companies had no insight or they couldn't disapprove it, he would publish it as it is. So this book gives you a lot of insights into Musk. He seems like a, I mean, he's brilliant, but a, quite a horrible person to work for. But they said part about halfway into this book that also totally changed my mind about middle of last year about this. And again, this relates to where people fit into doing work and the future of work in the light of AI. Now, there's a picture here of the Tesla car factory. He's got a number of mega factories and it's, it's maybe the most automated production lines in the world. There are robot arms and automated things assembling almost the whole car from start to finish. And one day, he one of the final bolts that you had to attach to the frame of the car on this production line, there's this, and, and the book tells a story, there's this robotic arm that's like $300,000 that moves as the car comes past to actually attach this bolt. But that day that Elon Musk walked the floor, let me just pause there. Why is he successful? Two reasons. He knows more than most of his engineers. He's not just some exec sitting on the top level. But secondly, he's on the production floor every day and he famously sleeps there. He is the undercover boss. He asks everyone on the production line about what they're struggling with, no matter how seemingly important or not they are. That is why he's successful. So on this day, when he walked on the production line, he saw that this arm didn't work because the robotic arm needed maintenance. And he said, give me a, a wrench. So he took the wrench to attach this bolt and he did it in about five seconds. And he said, how long does it take the robot arm? And they said, well, about 30 seconds. And he realized something there that day, that it is just quicker and much cheaper for a human to attach this bolt on the car at the end of the production line. And then he gave this mandate that they should de-automate this production line as much as possible. Look at every point on the production line where a human can do it quicker and it's most likely a lot cheaper than these robots. Now, there are obviously spots on the production line where it makes sense to use a robot or an algorithm or something. And this is something I started taking a lot of my clients through. Who wants to automate everything is let's have a proper strategy Look at where technology like RPA and AI can really help, where it can do it quicker and more accurate than humans. But what are those points in your flow, in your value stream that only humans can do because they are cheaper and they are quicker and they can think while they're doing it and they can learn. So don't just technologically automate the whole value stream. Again, the end goal of automation is efficiencies and effectiveness and alleviating people from work they should never do. And it may or may not be AI. So again, an absolute book worth reading. So rather than just automating everything in your business that will impact the future work of your employees, I encourage you to go on a de-automation strategy. Find the places that only humans can, the things that only humans can do and not AI. And this, now I come to, and we're almost toward the end, a bit of a, what do we do next? So we, we represent different kind of organizations and businesses on this masterclass. Some of us are working for much larger organizations than others. But here are just some practical tips I want to give you. When you think about 
AI automation, the future of work in your organization and so forth. Apart from the things that I've already said, the bring the printer closer, the common sense stuff, the de-automating, please make sure that the core team that builds your automation and AI strategy is from a multidisciplinary background. What do I mean with that? Because what we often do is we either outsource it to a vendor, that's a technology firm or an audit or a consulting firm, or we totally trust just our own IT team with it. Now we need them because they have the technological and the technical expertise. But remember this technology will fundamentally change the way your organization works, how you recruit, how you onboard, how you manage, how you promote, how you manage your clients, all of your back office functions, all of your front office functions. It's not just a little thing in the corner. So, so what I often ask clients that want to bring in AI is can you imagine what your organization will look like in two or three years if you do it? And most of them will say, well, we never really thought about that. We just want to AI stuff. So what do I mean with a multidisciplinary approach? Make sure apart from the technologists or the vendors that your HR or your human capital management team is involved, your recruitment team. Make sure that your organizational design team is involved, your change management team. Your legal team should be involved because the can of worms that we are opening up by doing this legally from an exposure point of view is immense potentially. Apart from multidisciplines, make sure that the core team are multi-ethnic, multi-gender, and if you can, from different places of the world because of our biases. And before I end off, I want to give you one simple example. If a bank, say a bank has six million clients, and they ask me to build an algorithm to identify potential family units in the data, so people with children or people who are partners and so forth, because they have a new product and say an insurance or a banking product that they want to market to families, not just individuals. What I would do, because remember, this is my worldview and this is my bias. I would build an algorithm that understands a family unit as a man and a woman that might have children. It's not because I'm wrong, it's just my worldview. So I need a colleague that will say, what about same sex couples? What about single parents? What about people who don't want to or don't have children? And so forth and so forth to make sure that the algorithm I build is not just the creation of my own mind, but it, it encompasses different people and how different people see the world. So I encourage you, when you start looking at this stuff, when you start looking at your future workforce, whether it's upskilling, attracting new talent, don't just bring in the technologists. When you think about your own future career, it's not just the tech. It's, it's sometimes it's not even the tech at all. It's bring the printer closer. What makes you a better auditor? What makes you a better nurse? What makes you a better business leader? There are elements of technology but there are also some common sense things in becoming a better business leader. So think about this with common sense, think about it holistically, get the views and advice from people who are much different than you to have a well-rounded approach. Now I want to almost done. I want to touch quickly on education. And again, this I can go on for hours. You, you are still, you are, you're still good because we don't have okay. any questions yet. And I think okay. you, if you need more, 10 more minutes, you're welcome to use it. Cool, Colleen, thank you. I'm almost done, um, but yeah, I can spend a bit of time on this. So I've, I've written this, um, so I write weekly for Business Day on Wednesdays for three years now. And uh, this article came out in October, why I won't be sending my child to varsity. Um, and I also, it was interesting, I never expected it uh, in December Business Day. You know, I remember Business Day, I have about 70,000 readers a day, whether it's uh, online or in the, in the papers. And they awarded me with the recognition that this article was the most read article for the whole year in the paper, which blew my mind because again, half the time I think, what the heck do I know? But it obviously ruffled some feathers and I'm gonna take you through the main things I say here. Uh, and this is relevant to today's topic if we think of the future of work in the age of rapidly advancing technologies, is are we training and educating ourselves, our workforce, but especially our future workers, our young people, 
adequately given where technology is going. Now, I've got a 10 year old son and um, and I work with a lot of uh, universities across the world, especially in South Africa. And, and again, they are wonderful people, smart people. Um, my frustration has often been, especially with the large universities, that they they move very slowly. Uh, they're very status quo aware. I mean, if you're a professor, then you have to almost like grovel and treat them with so much respect, because what do you know? While the world and the sand is shifting under their feet. And when I think about my boy, look, and he will only be 18 when I'm 60. I, I'm a late starter. I honestly, and this is a very personal thing. It's not that I don't want him to be educated. I will just not send him to university, not as universities are today. And let me give you a few points on that. Can you imagine going for a four or a five year degree? Irrespective of the field you're going in. With technology and the world changing so quickly. That what is the chance that you will still be employable and relevant after four or five years? Now, I want my doctor to go to university, of course. But I think there are many people who think that the only, if they can afford it, the only way to be secured of a job one day is to go to university. The answer is education. It's not the university per se. It's self-education. It's shorter courses. It's some of the things that Colleen and her team at CTU is doing. Maybe a three-week course on this, maybe a five-week course on that. Constant educating yourselves. But the reason I, and again, it's my personal view, won't be sending my child to university because I can't afford him to spend four years of his life and then ending off that honors degree or, or undergraduate degree being redundant and irrelevant because of how quickly technology is changing. It just costs too much money. I mean, what on average in South Africa at the moment, irrespective of going to live in or being in the res, I mean, to do a, a bachelor's degree is a, between 150 and 200,000 Rand, depending on where you go. It's even more in some other universities. So it, you, you might have taken a student loan or you might have been working in a coffee shop to try and pay it off. But now you end off your university time not only being unemployable, but sitting with two, three, four hundred thousand rands of student debt. That's why I won't send him. It takes too long. And as, as I've already alluded to, I think we need to focus on shorter, focused training courses that is practically applicable, not just book knowledge, to educate our children for the future while they are working. And again, whether it's at Checkers or in the coffee shop or in the spur or wherever, children should learn to work because it makes you mature, it helps you deal with different, difficult clients, it gives you that pride of, I bought my own little, I don't know, um, game for the internet with my own money and it's not no longer my parents. Look, and again, this doesn't apply to most people in our country because of the, the poverty and the unemployment that we're having. But I would rather my child find what he really wants to do and to do shorter training courses that build to a specific career while he's actually working and earning his own money. I think the other thing here is career guidance. I don't think when you are 18, you should be able to make a career decision because you know nothing. You think because you like Suits, that TV series, you want to become a lawyer, and then you go and study law at 400,000 Rand and four years, five years later, and then you hate it. So again, if my boy says he wants to become a lawyer, I will ask a friend of mine with a law firm, can, can he come and work there for six months? Making coffee, carrying paper around, see how it works. Don't make a career decision when you're 18 and the career guidance our children are receiving in school is very wrong, very limited. So that's the other problem. I think we should focus on what I call unautomated or unautomatable jobs. Because most of the so-called knowledge work that we are doing at the moment is highly automatable. Blue collar, white collar, doesn't matter. You know what I think will be one of the highest earning jobs in the next 10 years? is plumbing. Because how do you automate that? How do you AI that? We already see in some first world countries. I remember when I lived in England for 12 years ago, some of my mates who were plumbers earned a hell of a lot more money than me who were in technology and, and working with large clients. So what are those jobs? Because and caregiving is another one. I wish that people who do nursing or teaching for that matter or do caregiving earn so much more money because it's an admirable and an important job to do, but they don't. 
So focus on the kind of work that's not automatable. And the other thing, just in light of this point five, is don't just have one career. Don't just have one job. Do five different things. This is where the gig economy comes in, the Uber kind of economy. Maybe do a bit of teaching, maybe do, do a bit of bricklaying, some plumbing, um, some uh, accounting work. Focus on various careers because they all have their ebbs and flows. And one of the biggest problems I have with education, it's not personalized. It's a one from primary through to secondary, through to tertiary education. It is one size fits all. And we are different kind of people. We learn differently. Some learn quick, some learn slower, which doesn't mean they have a lesser uh, intelligence, but we have this one size fits all. And through technology and through the data we have in our students, we can customize learning without changing the curriculum necessarily that fits them best to really learn and thrive. So those are those are some of the reasons. Now maybe I'll change my mind in the future. Um, I don't think university is necessarily a guarantee of a great future and a great earnings uh, ability. So how we educate, whether it's exec ed, whether it's learning and development, whether it's training young people, we have to massively rethink how we train people for a future and for jobs that we even can't imagine at the moment. Now, before I go to Q&A, I just want to recap some of the main things I've said. We started with this thing. The, the big elephant in the room here, when it comes to this topic of AI and the future of work, is job displacements. And I mentioned, even though people might say every industrial revolution, don't worry, the net effect was positive, it will not happen again. Constant change, constant pivoting, constant re-educating yourself is here to stay. And also, we live in a world now where if your health is okay, every one of us on this webinar will most likely hit 100. How do you finance yourself? I mean, where's the world of going on pension at 60 and financing the next 40 years? I don't see, unless you've made a lot of money and good for you, but most of us, I don't see how we will ever stop working until we die one day. But hopefully through technology and upskilling ourselves, we can do the kind of work that helps us even when we're older. Technology, remember I spoke about Conductrief, I spoke about that book by Sean Cully, those six waves, those waves of innovation. It's here to stay and it's increasing in power and increasing rapidly. We have to look back at technology like Conductry have helped us to, to look forward to see how it's going to impact us. Spoke briefly on those two slides about what's AI really. Remember what I said, we can see, we can execute work, we can understand language, we can keep on learning. AI can do the same. And then what is AI, not AI? The ability to predict, the ability to see patterns in data, the ability to provide answers to questions and so forth. I spoke about the bring the printer closer. What is common sense? It's not as common as we think. The answer to your business problem might not be technology and most probably is not AI. There are many other things that you should consider, but how you work with people. Remember, get into the trenches, be the undercover boss like Elon Musk. De-automate your business where only people can do certain things. And that was some of the practical steps. Also remember what I said here, multidisciplinary core team multi-ethnicity, uh, multi-gender, and so forth. Just make sure that when you approach this technology, not only that you are in the trenches of your people, that you understand their work, but that your thinking and your strategy is shaped by people who think greatly different than you to make sure that you have an all-encompassing strategy and not a strategy that, that just fits you and your worldview. And then lastly, I spoke about education not sending my child to university one day. So with that, um, Renee, I've, um, <laughs> hopefully people are still here and listening. Uh, I want oh, yes. to unshare and then very keen on your comments and questions. And um, hopefully, you know, even if, even if the one thing I leave people with today is, wow, there's four things I've never thought about before, because I can't give you all the answers. If I've rattled your cage a little bit in the construct of your life and your family and your work, I gave you a few things to think about. I think it was a worthwhile session in my view. So we do have three questions, Yuan. I'm going to start with um, with the first one. I think that was dropped in Q&A. It seems like it was the first question. So um, Stephen says, uh, one of the things mentioned was to bring lawyers into our build and um, model design. I think it's lawyers. Uh, what question would we ask the lawyer to see if they can handle the law side of an AI model build? Yeah. It's a hugely important question. The problem we have is that there's 
essentially no regulatory framework. In the EU, we've got the EU AI Act um, that will only be written into law in about two or three years, but it mm -hmm. seems to be quite mature. Um, I mean, I had a training three day training session with one of our big banks last year um, with their legal team. And what they said to me is, I mean, the bank is obviously bringing in more and more AI, more and more chatbots, uh, more and more digital assistants, more and more automated decisioning systems is what must we as a legal team do to be prepared? And unfortunately, there's there's no law anywhere in the world in our country. Yeah, we've got privacy pop here, which is mm. poor legislation. We've got no regulatory framework on AI. I think most people in our parliament and in our cabinet don't even know how to switch on a computer, sadly. But so companies have to build their own legal framework. So why do we need lawyers? Because it's about exposure to risk, exposure to damage claims. If an AI chatbot gives me incorrect financial advice, what could be the claim against the bank, for instance? An example I like to use is if a drone flies into a building and causes damage, who is liable? Is it the drone pilot? Is it the manufacturer of the drone frame, you know, the airplane? Is it the people who built the algorithms? We don't know who is at blame. Is everyone at blame? So when you as an organization start bringing in this technology, in the light of no regulatory framework, you will need some legal advice on what are you exposing yourself to. So for instance, for the banks, I will say, and then because it's also highly regulated from a financial advice point of view, I don't think you should ever, ever have a chatbot give financial advice. Because if it's wrong, who do you blame? It should be a human. You know, so I think it's imperative, given the potential risks, that you have some legal um, uh, involvement, whether it's just an outside firm or, or not, but you have to because it can destroy your business and can destroy your clients. And it, the potential um, the reputational risks and other risks are immense as you go on through this journey, Kaleen. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay, the next question is, uh, what skills will be crucial in the future AI job market? The ability that's, to, that's from Noni. Uh, I love that question. I saw it now. The ability to think um, more than anything. So forget machine learning, AI, Azure, Microsoft. Those things are very important. But also remember, and it depends on what the question is aimed at, because is it broadly? Because it's impacting every career. So if you want to become an AI expert, machine learning engineer, et cetera, there's a different answer because you have to absolutely upskill yourself. And again, there's stuff that CTU offers that can really help you guys. I mean, I've looked at some of their courses around Azure, you know, Microsoft Azure and AWS. It's brilliant. But if you say, I, I'm not interested in all the technical stuff, I just want to become a better business leader, then I think familiarize yourself with the technology without become, having to become an expert. When a colleague or a vendor talks about AI, ML automation, at least know what they're talking about. But, you know, there was a great article in, it, in the Atlantic seven years ago with the title, Is Google Making Us Stupid? And the point of the article is, it is. I mean, we don't have to think and remember stuff as much anymore. But for the future of AI, focus on the stuff that makes you uniquely human, and that is critical thinking, empathy, helping people, um, getting the best out of people as a business leader, along all the other stuff that we learn, AI and stuff. So I think, yeah, that's maybe not the question you're expecting, but become a better, smarter, more informed human being, I think is the answer to the future of mm. AI. Yeah. I, I agree. I think in developing those strategic skills is so, so important. Um, then uh, Tsekhi is asking, uh, you mentioned that AI can't replace humans in terms of displaying empathy, for example. Do you believe it's possible to develop sentient AI? And could that be able to replace humans in terms of displaying our characteristics? Not surprised because that question always pops up and it's an important one. So there are so many different views on this. Because sentience um, is connected with consciousness. Now, we are the only beings on Earth, as far as we know, who are fully conscious. Although I often joke when I look at most of the people I work with, I don't even know if they are conscious, um, but that's just a joke. <laughs> but what does consciousness mean or sentience? It's self-awareness. So my dog does not know it exists, most likely. It's just, it's an animal with a fight or flight instinct. It wants to eat, it wants to procreate, it wants to defend itself. 
But as a human, I am aware that I am. I'm aware that, and this is where the philosophy comes in. I'm aware that I'm important. I want a place in society. I want to feel good when I do good. So, so when you play chess against an AI, the AI will always beat you because it can predict 55,000 steps ahead. But does the AI know that it's won? Does it feel good that it's won? Does it feel more self-aware? And that's the question of sentience. So I think for the foreseeable future, we won't reach sentience. I think we eventually will. And that opens up a whole new can of worms. Because if AI is self-aware, it will be conscious and it will have fight or flight. And it will turn against us. So what if you build a platform to do a task and it feels that that task will impact its own future survival and it says, no, I won't do it. So I think we are far from it. Will it come? Very probably. Hopefully we're not alive by then because that, that is the super intelligent chaos scenario that I think our children or their children might be left with. But we are far from it, I think, Aline. Great right. question, though. I agree. I agree. Um, and I think uh, so we've got one statement that follows up on on the discussion on uh, bringing law into the introducing AI in your business. So Donald says, um, Johan, but following your arguments on financial advice, sure, the same risks flow to self-driving cars. Um, and he says, I think financial advice would be a lower risk. Good question as well. Um, so, so let's start with self-driving cars is. Look, and again, the technology is not as advanced as we think it is. Mm. Um, it still struggles. I mean, and, you know, like the Tesla cars are amazing because there are millions of them and they learn from each other. That's what makes them incredible. So, for instance, if I see a stop sign, it should be red. What if it's green? What if it's not um, in an, what's an actolon or the shape of an eight? What if it's on its side? What if it's in the dark? And that's where machine learning comes in to realize that's probably a stop sign, even though it doesn't look like it. That's also how it recognizes pedestrians uh, and the like. But I don't know about all of you. If I ever have a self-driving car, it would be fun to play with. But man, my hands will be <laughs> near the steering wheel because I don't, still don't know if I trust it. Um, I might be lazy and get it to park itself, to call it to come and fetch me at the shops if I need it and so forth. So, but Donald, it is an interesting question. So, and again, that's, it comes back to what I said earlier, that balance between what only humans and machines can do. If we think of the banking or the financial advisory space, what are those repetitive low value questions that clients might ask? Like, what's my balance? Uh, can I have an overdraft? Um, when is my next payment? That can be easily automated because it's almost a waste for a human to have to answer that question. But in my view, when I have a real problem financially in my business or my personal life and I re need empathy and proper advice, I want an experienced human to do it. So that's for me different than asking for my account balance. And so how do we get tech to set that experienced human free to help me to not answer all those nonsense questions I have to ask? And will it change in the f future, Donald? Will, will the AI become smarter than humans? Probably, but what if it gets it wrong? That's the question. And what if I lose 100,000 Rand because of a chatbot's advice? Who do I sue? Because there's no legal framework for that. But it is a great question. Sorry, I couldn't give you a definitive answer. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's uh, that's brilliant for now, Johan. We don't have any more questions, but I would like to maybe, since uh, we can at least uh, give everyone a chance to get to their work as, as they need to, I want to mention that we are planning on collaborating with Johan on a regular basis on AI-based topics for webinars. What I'd like to do is encourage you that if you do get one of our invites or one of our notices, share it with your staff, share it with your team, I'm pretty sure it would be valuable for them to join as well and just get the same insight as you do. We all know it's not a popular thing to watch a recording. A lot of people prefer engaging with a real live session because they can actually ask direct questions or react to, to some of the comments. So for future reference, if you do get any of our invites, I encourage you to share it with your staff or with your team, because not only should you know this, but it would be beneficial for people working either with you or um, in your team, maybe in a lower position or a higher position to know all of this, because as you mentioned, this is constantly going to influence the future workspace, probably not as rapidly now as we might think, or faster than we think. We don't know what the future holds, but we can predict in a certain way compared to previous industrial revolutions. Um, 
So I think uh, what I'd also like to mention uh, again, thank you, Yuan, for always joining us on AI related topics. It's always valuable. We even learn from it every single time. And for those who are interested in partnering with CTU to get some upskilling related to AI and data or even beyond that, because I think something that Yuan always says is if you don't know how to use Excel, why are you bothering with AI? Because Excel's already developed to automate a couple of things for you. That's also something we can help you with. So you can either visit our website and complete a form. All of our forms allow you to direct to a campus that's nearest to you. And it's not necessary that you go to the campus, but you can engage with the right consultant um, at the specific campus. Or if you want to go the direct route, you can drop me an email. I've shared my email in the chat and I will make sure you get connected with the right consultant. Um, but I think in conclusion, Yuan, thank you so much. Valuable session as always. And I'd also like to mention to the uh, attendees that we are going to continue sending out notifications of future sessions. Um, all attendees can expect to receive the recording and the slides of the session. We're not sending it to registrants, only to attendees. And uh, we hope to see you again in our next one. So Thanks, thank Colleen, you everyone, everyone for attending. Take care. Thank you everyone. Have a lovely afternoon. Good luck at the, at work, and uh, we hope to see you again at our next session. Goodbye, everyone. Bye bye.